out of Nigeria. I would love to, um, of course, introduce our guest speaker today. So I'm going to read the bio. Mama Monica, for one second, can you please all turn um, mute your microphones if you have okay. your microphone turned on? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, you're not going to say anything. I'm going to be my mic. I'm going to hide it. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for that. So I'm going to be reading about our first guest speaker. His name is Oluwa Agoyeji, um, better known as T. That's what he prefers to be called as. So he. Ia Oluwa Oboyeji is the general partner and co-founder of Future Africa, a platform that provides capital, coaching, and community for mission-driven innovators, building an African future where purpose and prosperity is within everyone's reach. Prior to co-founding Future Africa, he served as the deputy director general for the Madam Oof, Oboy Iziki Sile 2019 presidential campaign. He also helped to build Endola and Flutter Wave, I'm sure everyone has heard of Flutter Wave, <laughs> two of Africa's largest and fastest growing technology companies backed by global investors. E. Oluwa, more popularly known as E, holds a bachelor's degree in legal studies from the University of Waterloo and is, an, and is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. He also sits on the board of a number of corporate and nonprofit organizations and, or, and advises a number of national and subnational governments across Africa on how to support high growth innovation driven entre excuse me, <laughs> enterprises in their domain. So with that being said, if everyone can just give him a round of applause, there are emoji buttons that give the ha ah, should you get the clap, 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 clap. So we welcome you. Thank you so much, Eve, um, for joining us this day. I'm gonna move on to our oh, next sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're welcome. I was saying you're welcome. It's such Thank a pleasure you. to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And for our next guest speaker, I would like to introduce Bolanji Emmanuel. Okay, and I will read his bio. An angel investor, an additional marketing expert with experience in software development, business management, business analytics, financial technology, and entrepreneurship. Oh, we got a heavy hitter on our hands. Currently serving as the CEO at termi.com, mm, my industry, or rather his industry, excuse me, activities include supporting techno technology entrepreneurs at Addy Ventures, Addy.Africa, as an angel investor. He is passionate about small technology-focused businesses because he believes that they are, they are a necessary tool needed at ensuring economic and financial growth across the African continent. So as we, oh, before I move on, let's give him a round of applause. Let's welcome our guest speaker, Papa Doc, pull up the emojis once again, do have that feature. We thank you and welcome you and we just celebrate you too for, you know, just allowing us to learn and glean from your expertise. It is truly a privilege and honor to be able to behold your presence and to be among um, men among men, you know, men that are worthy of our respect in our time. So thank you. Okay, so we are going to begin moving into the their um their spiel. We would love to hear from you too. I gave a little synopsis of what these two amazing titans are about, but it's very different when we're given an opportunity to hear from them um, personally. So I'm going to start with E. I would love for you to just tell us a little bit more about you know, your presence in the fine tech sector, especially on the African continent. All of us, to some extent, more or less, have a connection to Nigeria um, and to other African countries as well. So please give us some, um, yeah, give us a little bit more about what you are bringing to our, to our lives and the lives of our generations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for welcoming me. Um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, I want to apologize in advance for a little bit of the background noise. I had to take this at home, so I have quite a bit going on. <laughs> but I'll try to make sure it doesn't distract us from getting the whatever we can. Okay. So, so um, basically, you know, we, we you know, my, my own journey in tech really started out um, in an in an interesting new way, where um, I was. Um, 
you know, I, you know, I, I started out of, out of college. Um, you know, I was I was at the University of Waterloo, just up north, um, and and I was studying um, um, legal legal studies. So nothing nothing to do with computer science. Um, but but what was remarkable was you know we we're introduced very early to what was possible with technology because um, you know we're right on the banks of research emotion, which made the Blackberry. So we all got some practical experience in kind of seeing how technology that could extend around the world got built. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that experience really shaped a lot of, a lot of how I thought about technology. Um, and I had good privilege of working with quite a number of folks in the technology space very early on in my career. And that really shaped how I thought about technology and what the impact of technology could be. But I think ultimately, you know, after quite a bit of time, um, I'm trying to do this in Canada, I realized I didn't really understand Canada's problems as well as I understood Nigeria's problems, or at least I thought I did. And I decided to return home in, in 20, 2013 uh, to, build, to build businesses. And I must admit, you know, coming back home was one of the best decisions that I made, but at the time, it, it felt like one of the most painful decisions I made because um, to be very honest, I, uh, I basically came back home without very much of a plan and a little bit of money. Um, I very quickly ran out of the money and um, I, I realized that uh, my plan didn't make sense because it required government permission, which I never got. Um, and so ultimately I was a very brave, broke entrepreneur and I had to make my way in Lagos or as my father conditioned it, find the job. Um, and so it was it was either I kind of braved it or I had to go back to my parents um, and and take a job at NLNG. <laughs> so I, I obviously decided to defiantly attempt to make my way and that was how I ended up um, trying trying to build um, in Yaba um, where I was born. Um, well, the beautiful thing was you know after. Um, um, that, you know, I got joined up with Jeremy Johnson, um, helped build a company called Andela, which is transforming talents, marketplaces, um, and, um, and the rest is somewhat history. Um, but with Florida Wave, I think, I think the biggest motivator was just seeing the amazing talent we had access to at Andela, and then realizing that, you know, if we didn't build a payment platform that could connect all this brilliance to the global economy, on their own terms, um, we would very quickly end up with a situation where you did have the talent, but you didn't quite have a lot of the talent be entrepreneurial enough to set off and build new businesses uh, very much in the way that the likes of Termai have. So, so, um, and then, so that, that was what led me on the journey to work with Bing Agwala and uh, Lake Kia De Koya to go build a lot of ways so we could build this platform um, that could connect Africa to the global economy. And, um, it's been an, I guess it's been an amazing experience. Uh, Floodwave is now the most valuable startup on the continent. And um, I think I learned a lot, a lot from, about that experience about what it takes to actually bring about real change in our society um, and push the limits of disruptive innovation. Um, and I'm especially excited about all the different new innovations that that, that push with Floodwave has birthed. So, Super excited, um, and um, that's that's pretty much the close notes of the story. I don't know if I answered your question because I only caught a bit of it. You did. I mean, I, um, we were. I was really like you know interested in, and I mean, all of us, your journey to success. So I thank you. Um, if you would like to add anything more, I think you really you outdid Wikipedia. That's what I'll tell you. You outdid it. You gave us <laughs> you gave us the gist, the proper gist. So um, thank you. That was that was excellent, and I I think your story is very encouraging. Um, you are not a how do I say this? You your vision far exceeds the the current situation of the current state of Nigeria, and I think a lot of people they need to know that this is not a, um, an abnormal or atypical thing. You know, in every country there are there are visionaries, people that are forerunners, and you're very much so that. So thank you for sharing your bio, your bio with us. No, thank you very much. You're very generous. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next. We're going to move on to our next panelist. 
Um, Bolade, would you please share with us your journey to success? We are highly interested in, in you know, learning about how you got to this place where you're, you're now joining us. All right. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's actually a pleasure and also an honor. I, and um, also, like I used to say, uh, my big boss here. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, like my, my journey is actually tied to, 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 to him somehow. So I think I'll try to express that also. Um, so basically, I personally, so I'm, I'm really not the tech guy previously. So I started out in uh, urban planning. I'm more of a designer, right? So I, I studied um, design in school. Um, so I, I did a lot, a couple of stuff around that, but um, the arm of design I did was more in urban design. So um, I didn't really see much future there, right? So I, I decided to go into tech. I think at that time, tech was still very early. Um, it's really not the way it was. So how I started was to join a couple of, um, what do you call it, um, events and programs, uh, you know, at uh, one of the um, that's, uh, tech incubators in, in Yaba, right? So I started attending that and meeting people. And, um, you know, one thing to another, led to another, I started learning how to program and um, go more deeply into tech, right? So I, I kind of branched into digital marketing instead. I think everybody that doesn't know how to code from, from the start usually just goes to digital marketing kind of, right? But it wasn't enough for, for, for me still, right? So I still went more into software development. So I started building apps and, and programs and, and things like that, right? And that's like far back in say 20, 2014, 2015, basically, right? So I, I basically started um, uh, consulting at that time. So I've, I've done consulting for more than 30 companies, right? In different sectors, right? So I did a lot of digital marketing consulting and also building applications for some of those people. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, down the, the, the line, I, um, during one of those processes, I actually worked for a company as CTO. Um, and, and that's where I really found out the problem that most of these businesses were, were having, right? Um, the company is called Hughes. They are no longer um, um, that's alive anyways. But when they were, they were like one of the hot thing in the um, retail sector. They were selling female shoes, but the volume of transactions happening was just crazy, right? But they were trying to re-engage customers and get them to keep using their product over and over again. And they used more emails, but it wasn't really effective, right? So I started thinking about, okay, how do I make this more effective, right? The most effective channels available is SMS, WhatsApp, right? And um, any instant messaging channel in the continent. So I hooked up with um, so my co-founders and, um, you know, started thinking about that. Um, I kind of had to first go to business school. So I did um, a couple of um, stuff, uh, like a course at uh, Lagos Business School um, before returning back again. And um, I did a lot of, uh, a, a little bit of work also. I worked with accounts here. So I wanted to learn the fintech space because I was more targeted towards um, the retail and the financial sector. So I want to really understand the financial sector, right? So I joined a company called Accounts here and stay there for, for a while and learn that particular space before coming back and starting to my properly and focused more, more on it, right? And um, so far, it's been an amazing journey, right? I think in 2019, that's when my course part with E, um, I read one of his articles from Future um, Africa, right? So at that time, um, one of my early investors, um, Dayo, right, called me up and said, are you not going to apply for YC? I said, what's YC? So he said, like, you need to apply for, for YC, right? And uh, then he shared, as ease document with me from Future Africa, right? And I read it like a test book, basically, right? And, um, you know, I, I actually implemented every single thing in that document, basically, and um, used it to apply for YC. And, you know, I got into YC and the rest is history since then, yeah. Okay, wow, that was such a, a thorough background. Thank you for your transparency in sharing with us how you started. I don't think it's by accident. Um, from what I was hearing, and I don't know if anyone else can, but the similarities in a the the the, uh, the, the willingness to learn new skills, you know. Um, well, I I heard you say that you didn't start, you know, with where you are uh -huh. now wasn't where you thought you were going to be. You started with urban totally. planning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So I think that is is extremely inspiring to hear that you don't you're not trapped by your job title or by the career that you once started in. You 
you're as long as you have this life, you have a platform to change and to you know move around different industries, despite what we are oftentimes told in society, right? As if we're married to our jobs. So I'm really excited and I'm happy to hear that you know what has worked for you can also be applied and also work for others as well. So I'm gonna move on to look. I have a question for the both of you too. I would love for um, each to answer. And this is a specific question. Okay, because in as much as you two are both in fine tech, you two are also, and you guys just have, you know, interacted, you have met, I love the brotherhood, I love what I'm seeing. Uh, you, got, you two have also um, have your own respective niches, correct? So the questions that I'm going to ask is for you, and I, you know, we would love to hear um, your personal take. As I'm asking these questions, everyone, I would also love for you to begin thinking about the questions that you that you have for these two individuals. You know, we want to seize and take these opportunities seriously because them giving us their time is a luxury. So the first question I actually have for you, E, is how do Africans in the diaspora, um, how can they contribute to the tech ecosystem in Africa? So I'll ask that one more time. How can Africans yeah. abroad in the diaspora contribute to the tech ecosystem in Africa? Fantastic. Um, you know, I, I, I happen to be one of those people who thinks that, you know, our diaspora have been a major part of the tech in Africa story. And maybe we don't talk about it enough, but, you know, I remember the first time I went out to Y Combinator um, and how much support we got from um, the the Africans in the Bay Area, um, particularly the folks, um, the Nigerians, right? And it was super amazing to be joined up with them and some some of their homes and and hosting and all that. But to get to brass tacks and specifics, I think there are three primary um, opportunities, as I see it, for diaspora to get deeply involved in Nigeria's tech ecosystem. Um, the first is around skills and talent. Um, you know, as, as promising as the tech ecosystem is, it actually has a heightened technology, um, technology and talent need in particular. Um, so, you know, you would find, and, and not just technology talent, but even, <clears throat> sorry, even operational talent, um, talent that just knows how to um, write and, strategize and plan. Um, the, a lot of those things are not native um, to, to the talent here because they may not have seen it done at a, at a very excellent level. Um, only those who have been fully exposed have that luxury. Um, and, and it's important to transfer those skills. Um, so, so diaspora actually are perhaps some of the most interesting talent prospects that the ecosystem has. And um, it would be, it's always interesting and amazing to be able to leverage them as, as required. So I would say the first one is, is really with respect to talent um, and skills. And, and some people have found some interesting ways to transfer skills. So I know there are quite a number of groups um, like Mentor Color, where people actually um, get together with people uh, who, sh who are growing in a specific skill set online. Um, and mentor them. Um, so whether it's engineering roles or chief of staff roles or operational roles or customer service roles, there are many opportunities for you to mentor up and coming talents in Nigeria by simply giving a little bit of your time. And thank God for Zoom, um, you can transfer the knowledge that you have and mentor and support. Um, and that's a big need. The second is with respect to investment capital. Um, naturally, you know, quite a number of our diaspora have uh, more disposable capital than those of us who are dealing with the Naira. And, um, and, um, and there's an opportunity for you to invest um, very early in some game-changing companies via quite a number of platforms that have now popped up to do so, um, whether it's Hulk, um, whether it's RallyCap. Um, in our case, we have the Fund for Africa's Futures, collect the Future Africa Collective, um, so there are all these different interesting platforms that you can use. You can get together with other of your friends, analyze um, emerging businesses. Or well, there's also get equity. Um, get together with your friends, analyze emerging businesses, and invest. So again, that's something I would I would recommend. 
Um, I think I think Boladi also has one, but I don't think that's open to outside capital, right? Is no, it's not. Boladi is too rich; it doesn't want your money. Ah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, but but there's there's quite a number of groups that 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 can do that. Um, the third one is is actually a more sensitive one, and that's that you know being a great advocate for Africa actually really does help African companies. Um, so, you know, particularly now that we have quite a number of Nigerian Americans in very, very high places, there's a, there's a real magic to being able to, you know, manage and hand off, um, you know, be an advocate for the continent when it comes to investments from large American corporates, um, when it comes to advocating for African companies in front of large um, decision makers. It's extremely important that we play our part. Um, to demonstrate both the opportunities as well as um, honestly um, um, communicate the challenges. Um, so, so I think I think those three things are extremely important. Mentor the next the next generation with respect to skills and talent. Mm -hmm. Invest in the next generation of entrepreneurs via all these platforms, and um, and most importantly, be a great advocate for Nigerians and and all and Africans. Um, in the rooms and in the spaces that matter, where you have influence. Mm, that was an excellent answer. Thank you for breaking it down for those of us uh, that are interested in partnering with African on the ground, African businesses, um, you know, and, and, and also like encouraging those of us that are abroad to not sit on the talents and the gifts that we have, right? Um, being an advocate, oftentimes um, requires us to lend our expertise, you know, and in the comment section, I don't know if everyone can see, we have posted the mentorcolor.org, I believe, or .com. Um, for those of you that, you know, especially those of us that are here in the States, Canada, the UK, that would love to um, follow suit, right? We would love to run with the vision that E is sharing with us. I would love for those of us to connect with that organization um so thank you so much for that response it was it was really um insightful and encouraging so the next question i have is for bolaji um and the question is how do future um africans serve um, this idea so let me go into this a little bit more how easy or difficult is it for um, African entrepreneurs who are building solution-driven ideas and tech startups, um, how difficult or how easy will it be for them to um, essentially get to where you are from your own points of view? Because um, a lot of us, we, we see what you're doing, but we're like, oh my goodness, how do we make this jump? How do we make this transition? So for those that are you know, goal-oriented, that, you know, um, want to be a part of um, Africa's future, not just Nigeria, but Africa's future as a whole, how difficult or how easy will it be for entrepreneurs who are solution driven to um, enter into the, the tech startup landscape? Okay, uh, thank you for that. And um, thanks E for that also. Um, I think my, my response would um, start from where E stopped, right? Um, so I think I'll also say a couple of things um, on um, what he mentioned about the diaspora being involved too. I think that actually helps, right, uh, entrepreneurs, right? And I've seen that really, really um, being useful. You know, one of the, the things I noticed was um, when I came for YC, and I'm sure E would, uh, would also acknowledge, right? Um, it was like, I was, um, you know, when you get somewhere and you're just like, like you are, you, you, you are, it's like uh, you're in another zone completely. Now I'm not talking about the US, I'm talking about YC, right? Um, that's why I usually encourage people. Uh, I know YC now is more, more or less um, remote, but when it was physical, right, I used to encourage founders to attend every single event, right, basically, right, that don't do that YC thing of traveling up and down, just stay, stay put, basically, right, and um, I saw there's something that I noticed, which I, I really did not find amongst my, my peers in, in, um, in Yaba, basically, was that growth mindset, right, mm -hmm. that mindset of, um, of um, wanting to grow the company yeah, innovatively in a different manner, basically, right? So we have um, um, more like a hustling spirit in Lagos, right? Um, we have that um, entrepreneurial drive, right? But there's something about scaling, you know, as, as opposed to just um, 
being, I think Shark Tank guys calls it uh, being a entrepreneur as opposed to being an entrepreneur, right? So you have a lot of people that want to be an entrepreneur, but they don't really, um, you know, have those, um, you know, skills to really take it to becoming, you know, what they, 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 they basically really dream about, right? And that's why, you know, having platforms like Future Africa and some other platforms, right? And even um, the platform that also started Idea Africa basically is to help those entrepreneurs, right? To really think differently than what they're currently thinking, right? So one, one of the things I like about um, most of these new VC platforms that have actually come is the fact that uh, they don't just give money to, 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 to these founders, but they try to expose them also to the kind of mindset that requires them to scale your business, right? So um, as an entrepreneur here, yeah, if you really want to be, um, you know, get to that point of, um, of, of being successful, right? You need to do things that I, I think YC calls it things that don't scale and then also being real to yourself. I remember that early um, part of my, my business, I had to ask myself some hard questions, right? You know, um, am I too much in love with my product that I can't see the problems that the customers are really having? I can't see, um, or I'm not, uh, I remember that time, you know, you're just romancing your, your product and rather than going to talk to your customer, you are always just, um, you know, tweaking it, tweaking it, you know, you just have to launch, go to the market and things like that, basically. So, you know, so I usually tell people that you, you need to, um, you know, step outside your business, right? Step outside that idea and come and see from the perspective of the customers, right? And see the perspective of what these people want, right? What these customers want and how do you, and, um, and use that perspective from their own end to grow that business and get to your point, right? So there are many things that, that actually takes you to that being successful in your business. One of which is the customers. Secondly, is the, is the network, the people that you surround yourself with, right? The people that you get mentorship from, that you talk to, you know. Um, you know, Todd also is also your, um, as funny as it may sound, but really it's, um, it's also the kind of investors that you have on board, basically, that could also make or mar your, your business, the kind of people you, you surround you, you, that you, you, yourself with. There are some investors that, there's a particular investor that, um, that he mentioned, right? The guy literally shops my business on his head, right? That what I mean by, by that is he's not just, he didn't just put money on the business. He literally brings deals almost every month, right? So he's always trying to close deals for us, basically, right? And uh, some of these deals are not small businesses. They are actually large companies, right? Deals that even I myself would be difficult to close, right? So, you know, having such people in your corner really, really makes that difference, you know, basically, right? So for me, it's the customers focusing on your customers heavily. At Termai, we focus purely on customers, right? We make tweak on our platform, not because it's cool to actually do it, but because it's needed by the customers, right? You know, and then, you know, the people that you have around you, you know, and then, uh, and, and then also lastly is, like I mentioned, the skills, you know, you need to acquire certain skills. For me, uh, that's, um, basically, um, I do... I'm, um, I'm good at, um, you know, building my platform front and back, accounting, financial management, you know, every single thing basically, right? And, and the reason why I learned all of those particular skills is so that I know what the accountants are, are saying when they are talking. I'm not lost, right? You know, when the developers are saying something, I say something should be built in four days, right? The guys are telling me to take two months. I say, guy, I can do this thing my, myself, you know, that, that kind of thing, right? Basically, that I know that it's going to be tough, but I know you can do this in less time. You know, why you does what basically postponing it, right? So, you know, learning some, some of these skills that help you to relate with your team and also understand them, right, is very essential. And then finally, you know, having an, an amazing team, you know, selecting talent is very, very key to that could also break or mar your, your, your business, right, generally. Wow, that was so well-rounded. Um, thank you so much for sharing your take. Um, I particularly loved what you said, that humility, right? Not being married to your product, you know, being customer driven, you know, desiring to meet the needs of your customers or consumers, right? Customers, consumers um, over what is your, you know, what you consider to be your baby. So that is something I, and I know a lot of us on this, um, on this Zoom call really, really admire. Um, another thing that you mentioned that I would love to just reiterate is like, you know, teams, like teams and also recognizing the skills that you need in order to lead a team. You know, people oftentimes say, oh, you know, Nigeria, um, this, that, and the third, the quality of the people is difficult to work with people, but, you know, choosing the right, 
choosing the right team members is something that any business personnel will have um, to come up against, whether you're in the US or Australia or Nigeria. So I really loved um, that you were honest and earnest about some of the things that you have to go through from choosing the right team members to also being a master of all, right, of all trades. You're not just in fine tech, you um, have taken the time and the effort to invest in yourself, right? You're, you're, you're your greatest asset. So I really appreciate you sharing that with all of us. Um, it's something that I think a lot of us need to be, be more comfortable you know, understanding, even if we decide to outsource the work um, because we can't do it all by ourselves. It's still good to have those skills in our back pockets. So I'm going to jump into um, audience Q&A. Um, the next question I'm gonna put out you know, between the two of you two to the answer, you can um, either, one can answer or you can take one, the next person can take the other, but we are here for you. We want to hear from the two of you gentlemen. So the first question I have from our distinguished audience members <laughs> is um, for people that don't have tech expertise, right? What's the best way to get into the industry um, even if it's, it's from an uh, investor's perspective? Okay, so I know you touched on it a little bit, but if you can expound a bit more on what it looks like to maybe segue from a, a whole different field, right, whether it's urban planning or, you know, legal studies, <laughs> how do people make that transition? We want details, step-by-step -step details. So you get it. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the first thing is you got to have a thorough assessment of what skills that you have that can help um, that can be of service to, to tech companies. And you'd be shocked to find that tech companies do not just need tech expertise. They need operators, they need marketers, they need you know, people who are going to help them with security and reliability. They need testers, they need all sorts of people, not just engineers. So tech expertise actually doesn't preclude you. Um, now, if you've decided that you want to transition into a tech role, and I'll consider a tech role something where like product management or design or engineering or something like that, where it's, there's a specific skill set needed. If you know you don't have the skill, my advice is always to start by going to learn that skill. So take a bunch of courses, go and learn the skill because tech companies, particularly startups are not quite the kind of place you want to learn. And if you try to just kind of engage in some shallow um, exercise and then hope that, you know, you can kind of bullshit your way to, um, to a job in tech. I think the problem that you typically will have is, you know, you will easily be found out because the teams are so small. It's not a big company. So very easily you will be discovered, you know, for, for what you are and, and, and that would be a nice experience for anybody. Um, so I usually advise that just go and learn the skill and be honest about your skill levels. Um, and then I think the, the, the last thing is to be humble enough to start at the ground floor, right? <laughs> um, I find that a lot of people tend to index their experience and expect that to count in a different field when they're moving. But I find that actually, if you come into the space humble and you acknowledge that there are things you don't know, but there are also skill sets that are transferable, you actually tend to, because of your experience with learning and management and working under pressure and all that, to actually be able to transition way faster than most people would expect. So because you know you know what you know, don't be afraid to start on the ground floor. Um, and work and work your way up. Um, so I, 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 those are those would be my my three big tips. You know, one, you know, it doesn't have to be a technical role. Two, if it has to be a technical role, um, then go take a course at the very least so that you can learn. Um, and then number three, have the humility to start from the ground floor. Oops, sorry, that was good. Um, yes, there is there is no shame in coming to somebody willing and ready to be teached, 
right? To be taught rather, excuse me. So I like that. That was <laughs> Nigerian men are humble. Okay. <laughs> no, but thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Um, I actually have a question for the both of you two. I would love for, you know, for the for, for both of you gentlemen to weigh in on. So currently, right, what current challenges are you being faced with um, in this fine tech space? Yeah. Um, I'll go first. So I think there are three challenges that we have in the tech space. Um, the first is talent. Um, you know, we've, we've got a big talent challenge on our hands. We need a lot of very deep specialists, but we don't tend to have them uh, because our education system doesn't quite produce people in that mold at enough scale for the amount of investment that's going in. So you're finding teams having to recruit from all over the world to fill gaps in their business. Um, the second issue is infrastructure. Um, and by infrastructure, I don't mean termite. I mean, you know, physical infrastructure that's designed for helping startups scale. I was doing a, a, an audit the other day and discovered that, you know, you, you don't have any space in Lagos that can take up to a thousand engineers in a single building. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> Because without that kind, those kind of facilities, I mean, you can't say, well, why can't you just do remote work? But the problem with remote work and distributed work is that actually infrastructure access is not evenly distributed across even Lagos, not to talk of the rest of the country. So you have connectivity challenges, power challenges, security challenges, you know, water challenges all over Lagos. So, you know, I have found you know, this infrastructure challenge to be a big inhibitor to building really great stuff. And then the last is, is um, governance and policy. Um, unfortunately, quite a number of government officials just see tech as a rentier industry that can generate a lot of money for the government. Unfortunately, they're not realizing that, you know, the world is a global village. People can build companies from anywhere. So rather than try and tax the life out of people, you actually need to encourage them so that they can bring um, business to you and ultimately employ more people who will pay more taxes and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, those are the three big challenges, talent, infrastructure, and governance and policy. Mm. Okay, that was, thank you for that insight. Um, not everyone here is from Nigeria. So you're not just sharing with us um, the, the place that fine tech has, but you're also giving people an inside glimpse as to what the day, you know, what the, the daily life in Nigeria um, looks like for people who are innovators, who are visionaries, especially our young people. So thank you for that insight. Well, yeah. day, um, we would yeah. also love to hear what current um, problems or challenges you are facing. Yeah, so I will on that also. I think it's basically similar with uh, with E. I remember I sent him a mail. I said, um, "This talent seats that you're building, I want to to have a space yeah. there <laughs> because um, it, it's it's similar, right? Um, for example, the Temai building in Lagos, we've had to invest a lot of money in power there, right? So we so it's purely renewable energy there, right? So we had to, um, you know, we we're even doubling it, right, to have two. Two, um, two, two systems that can power the entire building effectively on solar basically because of light problems, right? So we don't have, um, sometimes engineers are working and light is gone. Um, diesel prices have gone up basically, right? So I remember it was so, it was so difficult to even run on diesel. So we had to run on inverters and solar basically, right? So you have those kind of things, you know, and we actually underestimate the, um, the impact this has. Imagine, tell my, um, I usually say that we are that company that you don't hear about, but we are powering several businesses, right? Um, you have Piggyvest that has over 3 million customers and they have, um, you know, a ton of um, uh, transactions going on. You have Cheaper Cash has ton of transactions. You have Paystack and you have a bunch of these companies, right? And we're powering all those transactions, you know, in real time, right? Now imagine if, um, if, if there's an issue and our developers cannot access internet right effective internet to fix those problems or you know or our customers we have calls almost every day every single second from night from 8 a.m to to 6 p.m you know calls are coming in based from different companies small large you know and all of that right and imagine customer success cannot 
pull a call through because of um, network is failing. And then why even in the messaging space, right? So you have uh, telcos having downtimes, you know, because we've had issues where telcos have downtimes for almost a month, right? Popular networks, you know, and you you see customers cannot verify transactions or verify stuff, right? So it, it's, um, it's an issue basically, right? So infrastructure is really a problem. And like you said, infrastructure, not, not TMI, but yeah, physical infrastructure, right? Um, it's really a problem, you know, you know, generally, and um, and it, it, it trickles down into giving amazing stuff, basically, right? And then even talent, right? Like you mentioned, right? Sometimes we, we basically have to fill some, 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 some spaces on, on the team with foreign talents, because it's not that we don't have the talent in Nigeria, uh, generally, but the point is, um, there's just a certain mindset that we are looking for, right, that... Um, um, some of the talent that we even have in Nigeria are leaving the country, right? So some of those talents, you can't even find them, right? Because they are, they are taking jobs of, um, in other countries, basically, right? Or they are, they are working for larger companies, right? So uh, some of them won't even want to work for a Nigerian brand. So most times we have to even position ourselves as a U.S. company, right? Uh, to even uh, access some of these uh, talents, basically. And, um, you know, they want to join because they want to be affiliated, right? So, so, so you have some of those, those things. And it's not really the people's fault. It's just that some of the talent coming from the universities don't have the skills that have been that, that have been looked for, right? So it's a challenge. And and on our team, we are scaling too fast that we don't even have time to. Okay, right now we've started building our own co developer community. We have over two hundred and fifty developer uh, uh, people in our co community with both developers and digital marketers. So we are trying to even build our own network to be able to access some of those kind of talent. But really, it's not supposed to be so, right? The the, the ecosystem is meant to provide some of these talents basically but the point is uh, you can't find them right all oh, they are so outrageously priced because of the competition from other countries or these people trying to leave the country right and um, you can't really sustain them in the u.s market right so i can't say okay you know what i'm going to employ you in the u.s office you know uh, it, it won't work like that because by the time you come into the u.s um, scene you need to be hired or employed here you know so it becomes the, the whole process becomes messy right so you are still left with hiring locally you know, and, and generally. So those things, talent and infrastructure, I think is extremely key. Uh, that knowledge gap at times in talent is very key. And I think we, are, we underestimate the impact. And those two things, they impact a lot on the business generally. Mm, okay. Wow, that was um, bringing us deeper into what's happening behind, you know, closed Nigerian doors. Thank you for that wonderful insight. From what I understand, um, from someone that isn't, hmm, would I consider myself a techie? Um, you know, there's levels, but for somebody that is interested in tech and finance and things of that nature, um, it seems like the the things that you have mentioned, you know, both of you gentlemen have mentioned um, about the place that technology has in fixing the problem, such as that infrastructure, you know, poor governance, um, even challenging business climates. It seems like you believe that technology can, can in many ways serve as a buttress to those issues. So E, I actually wanted to just, you know, continuing on, in on that point, um, for what I also understand, you are building um, what most people would say um, is a Silicon Valley in Lagos called Talent City. So do you believe, in, you know, from your point of view as a builder, as a forerunner, visionary titan um, in Nigeria, would you say that Talent City is in, in some way going to serve or help to fix some of the issues that Bolade mentioned? Uh, abs absolutely. I mean, it, it definitely will. Um, I think I think the world changed post COVID, and we're all just about to find out because the reality is quite a number of people um, obviously have gone remote. Quite a number of very large companies have gone remote, and now it's more acceptable for people to work from anywhere in the world, so long as they can get their work, their work done. And I think there's going to be a bunch of folks, especially people in this room who are Nigerian, that's going to be like, okay, well, I have a Nigerian passport. And I want a very, very poorly kept secret is that Nigeria is one of the best tax havens in the world. If you earn your 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 most of your wealth is in equity, because um, in Nigeria, if you earn equity or you sell equity in um, in a foreign company, you actually don't pay any capital gains tax, <laughs> so, which which is not possible to do anywhere else in the world. I think. Um, 
but essentially in Nigeria it's possible. So you have a default kind of tax um, advantage over there. And I think there's also other things that are going to um, make it make it super easy for people to actually um, come to Nigeria and live and work from Nigeria. Um, so what we've done basically is like we recognize that infrastructure is a huge problem. Um, and, um, and because infrastructure is a huge problem, um, if we can actually take the time, we've, we bought out 72,000 square meters of land in Ekbe. And basically what we're doing is building out from scratch um, a, 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 an amazing campus, you know, um, that's going to house, you know, thousands of young people who want to uh, build a future from, from here in Africa. Um, so, so you, 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 you know, there's, there's quite a bit of interesting work going on. We've got some very interesting anchor tenants and a very interesting mix of folks like Bola Day, who we're looking to welcome to Talent City. Um, once we, once we get, uh, get our first building off the ground by the end of next year. Um, so there's, there, there's quite a bit of, of work to be done there, but I think the real benefit of a talent city is that it, it essentially helps um it's going to really help to scale the model right it's going to show people this thing is possible and then uh, you know what's going to be really amazing is to see talent cities popping up everywhere across africa and our, and, and our, uh, 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 you know and basically being spaces where africans um can basically go and build the future mm. Okay, that sounds amazing. It sounds like uh, lucrative um, investment opportunities for those who are interested in seeing Nigeria move forward. So on that note, I actually want to um, answer into a bit of that. Somebody asked the audience, so what investment opportunities, right, whether it's Talent City or outside of Talent City, um, are there out there? You know, what type of capital um, would one be, be looking at? Just a little bit more. How do you make sure the ventures are the legit? Right. I know that's one of the um, yeah. another issue, too, is, you know, legitimate investment opportunities, somebody that is maybe a novice. So, yeah. What would those investment yeah. opportunities look like? So, I mean, I, I'll let Boladi also speak to this, but I think a lot of it is really going through the filtered um, investment communities. So if you look at stuff like Hulk or you go to places like, you know, you can come to Future Africa Collective. I know we're a little bit on the pricey side. Um, um, and, and then there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of other, other groups like rally cap. Um, you know, the, the reality is, you know, when you look at all those companies, um, you quickly realize, um, you know, uh, you know, that, that you can actually access a stream of validated companies and you can actually also have, um, an opportunity to put forward a company that has been proposed to you from maybe another group and have real human beings go verify if the company is a real deal. So I think it's just, you know, investing in communities is just so much safer. And a lot mm. of us should do more with, with um, great partners that have a good reputation. Thank you. Hola, Day, can we hear Yeah, so, so I'll jump in there. Yeah, so it's one of the things I'm actually grateful to um, Future Africa for is that um, I think, I don't know if uh, he also knows this, but a, a bunch of deals we've, we've pushed his way, they've invested in, in, um, in a lot of them, right? Um, so, so basically, like you said, speaking to that, right, if you really want to um, you know, support entrepreneurs and founders, you know, within the, because it's actually um, at, at the pace of which many of these companies are growing, right? Um, I've seen, personally, I've seen more than, um, uh, you know, a 5x returns, you know, on, on, on just little amount of money that I've put in, in some of these companies, basically, and they're growing very fast, right? But finding them it can be challenging, right? And also validating the fact that they can actually scale is also challenging. And, that, and that's one of the points why I started um, ID Africa, right? So like he said, it's not really open, like Future Africa is. So it's more like an LP structure, basically. And we, we basically handpick investors, right? But the point is that um, we are more like a validating arm for larger firms like um, Future Africa and um, larger firms like Rally Cap and, 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 and on and on, basically, and um, Kepo and a bunch of other guys, right? So what, what we basically do is we go more lower, right? So we look for the founders at when they are actually very, very rough. 
and some of them um, they are not well positioned basically right some of them don't even know how to scale their companies right um, they've not even ready start their company properly and things like that right uh, some don't even file their taxes so they are really not investable basically right so you won't blame the vcs when, when they don't put the money in right so we try to walk them through those those stuff right put them in shape right and then once they are well validated and bonded quite enough then we push them to larger funds like a future africa basically for them to invest we just put in a very tiny portion right so what we've done is to build a community right and like to to ease point investing in such uh, that's called community driven um, vehicles right it's much more um, effective to finding these companies that are well validated and well positioned properly as opposed to just uh, throwing your money away right Gen generally so for us we even take time right so so we don't even do the rolling thing right so we take time to actually find these companies and spend time with them till they are ready to take in ca uh, check and capital right so so yeah so i try so, so, so i think um there's opportunity there um there are other opportunities but for me i'm, I'm, I'm really not heavy in investing in other sectors i focus more on the founders and my, my business generally right right um and um and, and i and i think that it's very very effective to invest right um, in Africa, start now, right? <coughs> Invest in ni ni Nigeria, and um, also let me tell you a small secret, right? Whatever he is starting, investing in a in anything that he's doing, <laughs> he always makes sense. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank yeah. You. So, so, so basically, right? So it it, it really does, right? And I've, and I think that um, Africa is ready, and Nigeria is ready for a lot of capital coming in, right? So if you have that spare cash as a that uh, so on in, in the in the in the aspera, I think you should plug it in one of these companies, right? Um, and use some of the vehicles that, that we have, right? Like Future Africa Rally Cap hooks, right? Or even ID, right? But for for ID, we we'll basically have to screen you very well. <laughs> yeah, well that's fine. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bolade. Um, so PSA, he just gave you the inside scoop. Follow all all paths lead to E, and all those paths lead to Talent City. So if you're interested in investment <laughs> opportunities, mm -hmm, okay, um, follow the yellow book road, so to speak. But some of the links, if you're interested in learning more about those investment opportunities that Bolade mentioned, they're all in the comment section. So please. Make sure that you're copying, that you're bookmarking, that you're keeping um, in your in your personal files these venture opportunities or these investment opportunities, rather. Okay, so our next question for our panelists actually has a little bit more to do with intellectual intellectual property rights. Excuse me. So, how do you two go about protecting that? You know, we talked about poor infrastructure and things that are plaguing the Nigerian. Um, some people right so how do you to the best of your ability protect your intellectual intellectual property rights yeah it, it, it's it's generally a function of stage and scale um so so you know at the very earliest stages you you best protect your intellectual property by not talking about it <laughs> um and um and executing as quickly as you can um so so you know um that has generally been the pattern. Um, obviously, as you grow bigger, um, there are a number of interesting approaches you can take. I think the first thing is, you know, um, there, there isn't really any frameworks for protection of intellectual property rights um, um, to a certain extent in Nigerian law. I know we have like Nigerian patent law, but it's not plugged into global patent law. Um, and, 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 and the, you know, the other things like trademark law is not really plugged into global global trademark law and protecting your innovations only in Nigeria feels to me like a waste of time, in my opinion, because <laughs> it's not like you're going to be able to go to court to enforce your rights. So, but, 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 what, but what we advise startups to, to do is to go incorporate in the US where there's a little bit of respect, more respect for intellectual property rights and so on. And then they can kind of proceed to do the needful from there. So this is this is kind of our own approach to to solving that problem. Um, um, I, you know, I, I would, yeah, I think I think generally speaking, is you know at the earliest stages, just keep quiet about any of your secret sauce. Um, just let people see it, show rather than tell, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, you, you know, um, while you know you can you can also quicken your execution speed. While in later stages, you you can actually then do other uh, more interesting things, but from the benefit of like a global 
um, HQ or, or parents in the US or in Amsterdam or in any of the other countries where intellectual property rights are fairly handled. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think that was, for those that don't know what intellectual property rights are, Google is your best friend and LinkedIn is his cousin. So. <laughs> um, let, let me chip you. in something quickly oh, to, to what he said. Yeah, yes. so, so I think like he said, right, at the early stage, it's like you said, just move very fast, right? Um, yeah. um, it's a waste of time trying to secure anything in Nigeria, to, to be honest, right? Mm. Um, it really, it's um, people would always be, they will move if they, it's, it's, it's really who, who, who executes better, right? So just execute faster, you know, generally. And like you said, at a later stage, there are, there are now more ways to secure yourself, right? And keep quiet, right? So, so I really see a lot of tech companies in, in, in Africa and Nigeria, they make too much noise at the early stage, basically, right? And they expose themselves quite a lot, right? So, so at times you need to build quietly, um, okay. right? And, um, and but, but to actually build very fast, right? And for, for me personally, right, some, some people might think me paranoid a little bit, but I actually scan through my signups, right? So I have like an, a notification, every single person that signs up, I actually monitor every sign up, right? So I know every company that is coming on board, so if you are a competitor or you are somebody, I always go, <laughs> actually Google some of those, those, those things. Don't try it, right? Don't mind me. It's just me, basically. So I actually try to keep tabs with my customer base, right? So I really know quite everyone. And, and, and I keep tabs of the, of, of the ecosystem also and see who is building stuff within my space and um, who, who is doing something similar, right? And how they're doing it, right? So I really don't even see some of them as competitors, right? But I see them as a learning curve to really learn more about you know how these companies are even scaling faster right and uh, what, what they are doing and how i too can also improve better but at the later stage right you can now be much more particular about certain things um because at that point you are more successful and you know you you can't just let certain things slip through you know privacy becomes very paramount within your company you know letting things out there how you guys are executing very important if the staff leaves your company you know, you, you need to be sure have you put measures in place to protect some of the things that you guys are, are doing within either in house. And it's not that the person shares with, with the new employer or whatever, or anybody that pushes your, your employee, basically. So things like that becomes very, very key at a later stage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Balade, for weighing in. I think that was, um, I honestly really appreciate that. And I appreciate so much of what the two of you gentlemen are sharing with us today. But um, the, the necessity, the need for privacy um, and, and the prudence that goes with it. Um, it isn't just, you know, something that people are saying out of fear, but it is to protect what you are building. And I think that can go for anything that people are investing time, energy, and money into. So I think that was great advice for the entrepreneurs, you know, those who are looking to join you and E on your fine tech journey. So Kind of going in lieu with that, those who desire to um, join the two of you in that sector and or industry, for those who um, have a basis, whether it's in finance, technology, you know, um, again, that industry, for those looking to apply to jobs uh, or start a career um, after schooling, rather, what specific top skills um, and talents, you know, i.e. job titles, you know, category, things of that essence, are you aware of that tech companies or your companies in particular are looking for? So for those interested in the fields that have the background, right, but are maybe looking for, um, looking to apply, what would you recommend they put on their resumes, cover letters, things of that essence? I think you're muted. You're, you're muted. Oh, I thought that My was bad. me. Muted. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So I, I was just going to say, you know, my own opinion um, and, and my experience, you know, has been that pa passion is extremely important, and mission, but mission is, is is even is even more important. And what is mission? Mission is is um is I call it passion plus excellence, right? Meaning that you, you you're passionate about something, but you also understand the importance of getting it done extremely well, right? Um, and I find that 
whenever someone is, you know, um, is, 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 is looking to work with us and they come, they, 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 they come to us with passion and mission. We were, we're always excited about that person because, because, you know, the, the reality is, you know, that person can solve almost any problem. And honestly, I would argue that when we talk about the skills deficit, it's not a skills deficit in actual technical skills per se. It's a skill set deficit in what some people will call soft skills, right? <laughs> or but what I would call mindsets around getting things done. Um, and you know, the reality is what we need are people who have the judgment to take a look at something, anything, and say, this can be better, and here is how. Um, so more broadly speaking, that's what is, is needed. Um, and I, feel, I find that, you know, naturally, Nigerian Americans tend to have, to score very high marks <laughs> in that respect. Um, and, and so, you know, it's very important. Mm. Um, but, but, there, but there are other things, you know, if we want to get more granular, um, I would say, for example, there's a need for better, um, you know, better and more strategic senior executive, managerial talent. It's a okay. big gap in the ecosystem. So whether it's engineering managers, operations managers, um, you know, legal managers, people who have the ability to help organize um, and measure and improve other people's inputs. Um, I'll say that's one of the biggest gaps um, on the continent across across board. Um, and there's a there's a there's a really really dire need for those sort of people because um, that's the only way founders get to take vacations. Um, so, so I'll say I'll say that would be kind of the biggest gap um, that I see in my own work. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I love um, that that the soft skills that have oftentimes been neglected for hard ones, you know, technical skills. But I love that you that you mentioned, um, you know, those that have been neglecting the administrative side of of businesses. Maybe that's something that some of our audience members may be interested in pursuing. You know, not everyone is going to be um, e right. In, in, tech, or in tech and finance, we, we do need our managers. So I really appreciate you saying that, um, especially for someone like me that is pursuing her MBA in management. That is much appreciated. Bolade, we would love to hear from you as well. Yeah, so I think I, I agree with E, right? So I, um, for example, my company term, I, um, has it has basically scaled with um, young talent, right? So I was very particular about very young young people. So some, sometimes some people call, call, come to our site and they go to the About Us page and they say, well, uh, why, why is everybody here below, uh, you know, looking like they are below 35, you know, generally, right? So you have a lot of young, young people, right? But, um, you know, as we scale, I've seen that there's also a gap um, with, um, um, you know, um, managerial side also, and which is something that we are also, you know, actively feeling, right? Um, because it really want to scale from X amount to, uh, to, 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 to basically another um, stage. You, you really need those kind of talents, you know, on board, right? And it has really helped us, right? So I've seen, um, you know, for, for example, my, my company alone, right? One of my co-founders, um, you know, she basically, you know, has that particular skill that, um, that, you know, you can't just find, right, that administrative skill, basically, that could really get things done, uh, basically, right, and, and and it's very essential, and we've had to also bring people on board like, like that with such skills um, in terms of operations. Uh, I think there are skills that a lot of tech companies downplay, right, operations, um, you know, legal, very important, you know, legal is very key, basically, you won't even know how important it is until you get to your Series A, you know, then you begin to know that that's a very key skill, and not just outsourcing, People think, okay, I'll just get higher lawyers and outsource. No, no, no. You actually need some of these guys in-house, basically, to really help with certain things, right? You know, compliance, a lot of startups really overlook that, right? In my own space, you can't overlook compliance, right? You need to be compliant every mm -hmm. single 
mm. it's very very key and very tech tech companies downplay it right then you have you know place like um even even in engineering right so people focus too much on hiring the engineers themselves but don't pay attention to the managers right of those en- engineers it's something it's completely di- different right so having those people that are building stuff and having people that could manage the people building stuff is very key and then you have a gap there so you have many people that can build but they don't know how to manage they don't know how to set processes in place they don't know how to do the right um, pipelines the, the testing stuff like that. they don't know how to put talent in the right place right and, and it's something that we have to think about in-house, you know, and then even in product too, right? It's not just being a product manager, but do you have someone who can manage those product guys? Very key also, right? So so in all those administrative places are very key for if you really want to um, grow. And in my company, right, it's something that we're also thinking about, you know, actively, yeah. Thank you, Bolade. That was um, really, <laughs> really helpful to hear. Um, there, There's a there's an interesting balance that's being struck, you know, again, between hard and soft skills. Um, so for the person that asked about what, you know, job title should I put on that, my resume, you know, what skills I would, um, what I, when I hear you're encouraging people to write for those that actually have those skills to play up um, on both their, if they have engineering background um, as well as their managerial or their ability to you know, measure, manage, um, and, and keep track of metrics and things of that essence. Okay, that sounds really good. Um, how would you encourage tech companies here in the U.S.? So here for Bolade, right, because he's in California at the moment. So um, how would you encourage, and, and for E as well, because it is a, um, a global platform that he is bringing Nigeria into, um, both, both gentlemen, but how would you encourage tech companies here in the U.S. to use Nigeria or other African countries um, as one of the offshore 24-7 work models like India and the Philippines? Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, uh, companies here, I think it, it's, it's, really, it's really great, right? And uh, for example, I usually say that Lagos is not the only place, right? So, but the only problem with Nigeria is just infrastructure in some of these other um, locations, but really there are other hubs that um, that people can also leverage and that are coming up like Oyo states right is something that um, there are places that are actually coming up but you know that's a topic for, for, for another time but I think um, companies here can actually leverage in terms of uh, talent right um, and, and when I mean talent I mean um, you know um, how do I put it now young talent right uh, more affordable uh, basically right you know in the US things are quite expensive <laughs> basically even talent here is extremely pricey right but in terms of the lower management right in terms of the 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 more younger people if you just want someone to uh, maybe like an intern or like someone to just test on something or like a very early uh, stage employee right you could easily get them here basically right you could also get uh, um, very experienced talent from other sectors right for example we have a lot of amazing guys in the banking space right, that are doing amazing stuff that are moving into tech too so it's something that one should also look look towards right so i think foreign companies can also really engage that right i usually say something right that yes you could get somebody that adds value from the us to to nigeria to the nine uh, to a tech team right but then if you really want to grind and go down into the market like for example in sales i don't think you should compromise sales and maybe uh, ecosystem engagement and stuff like that with with foreign talents, for me personally, it's just my, my own opinion. I think you need people on ground, right? If you really want to hit the street, basically, you need people to understand the, the local market, right? So if, imagine I'm setting up a shop in Kenya. I don't think I'll just send somebody from Ni- Ni- Nigeria there. I would like to leverage the talents there, basically. And that's why we're advocating for more talent here, uh, basically. For me personally, yes, I'm basically here in California for more for, for business reasons, but really, running the company, I prefer to do it in Nigeria, right? Yeah, you just have to be there, right? Uh, you know, um, I don't think I buy that, um, you know, uh, just staying, you know, fire away, basically. You, you basically need to be on the ground, you know, generally, right? And, 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 and the same with talent. So I think if you really want to scale your company well in the African market, you need to at least be around and have people that are also on ground. So I think companies can also leverage that, right? Leverage that in the lower talent, leverage that in also the soft skills soft skills, for example, customer success, right? I think you would need people on ground for in, in, in like, um, that's what like a francophone regions in Africa, you need people on ground for, for roles like customer success and um, so, 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 so some other um, what you call basic soft skills, you really need to hire, you know, generally on ground. Mm. 
Okay. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that, again, like, helps us all understand um, what is the global link between Nigeria um, and other African countries, as well as those that are, um, that are looking to participate, that are living abroad. Um, e, I don't know if you, if you heard the question that I asked. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Would you like me to repeat it? I can do that. Yeah, I just repeat it because I, you know, well, I gave such a fantastic answer. I forgot the it question. <laughs> you really did. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, so the question for you is, um, how would you encourage, or what are your plans, right, um, for tech companies here in the U.S. Um, to use Nigeria or other African countries as one of the offshore twenty-four-seven work models, like India and the Philippines? So I, I think that's already happened to be very honest. That's already happening. Lots of people onshoring work. But very much like what they said, we've not invested as much in the infrastructure. Um, I was recently in Israel. Um, and, you know, even before the Ukraine-Russian war, people were already talking about doubling up on their Ukrainian talent with, um, with African talent and set, situating those places in Nigeria. But like I said, to this day, um, there isn't any space in Lagos, which would be the epicenter of such activity that can hold more than 800 developers working at the same time. <laughs> so when you think about that reality, you start to question quite a number of things, including what that means for whether we are ready for that deluge of opportunity. I was talking to a friend and he was telling me that 250,000 engineers um, are resident in Ukraine. Now, obviously many of them can't fight because uh, they've, their homes have been bombarded, or etc, etc. Um, however, despite this reality, right, um, you know, we still don't have the deep investments that are required in infrastructure that would enable us to take full advantage of the particular situation we're in today. So my sense is that, you know, we need to perhaps either privately, and that's what I'm opting to do with Talent City, or publicly by working with the government, take control of that and do something in a small little corner at the very least to help ameliorate the situation. Thank you for that response. Um, both really solid responses. You know, again, it goes back to infrastructure, but we look forward to Talent City, you know, in the works that Bolade E will be contributing to address those issues on ground. Um, and I don't mind the shout outs to Israel and Ukraine International. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, the next question <laughs> actually bounces off of what Bolade mentioned about the type of recruits he looks for. So the demographic from what I what we've all understood is you particularly aim to integrate younger um, people, right? People that are uh, more malleable in thought. You know, usually we, we tend to ascribe um, younger people that are more teachable, that are fresh, that are eager and passionate. Some of the soft, you know, they have some of the soft skills and um, the words that he dropped, right? About things that um, people who are looking to enter into the industry should have. So on that note, I wanted to actually ask Bolade about um, the, the young people and, and the work that he's already doing for them. So what programs um, do you have set up for elementary or high school students so that talents can start be, uh, talents can start being groomed in Nigeria? Yeah, so to be honest, right, I, I don't have any structures yet in place, right? But it's something that um, has been on my mind, right? So for example, um, I actually served in Oyo State, right? And um, I did uh, my service um, in a school, public school. I was still running my company at that time and I was doing all of that, but it, it, it exposed me to some things, right? I saw public school students very eager, right? To use the, um, my laptop, right? Anytime I'm working in the classroom, right? So they wanted to actually see what I'm doing. And some were actually interested in learning how to code because I was actually programming in, uh, in, in one of the schools. I think it was a school in UI right um a public school there and i was programming there and, and the girl was like i really like to le learn this basically but the school systems they um what do you call it they have desktops there and those desktops were bad you know you can't even say you want to train them right so you know that led left a lasting 
impression on my mind. And I said that one day when um, I'm able to support these guys, I'll come back to this kind of place, right? And I'll see what I can do, you know, what kind of programs can, can actually be, be basically done there. So it's something that's, that's been on my mind, right? And it's something that, um, uh, what do you call it? I'll still do. But I think at a large scale, that there is only a limit to what private sector can, can really do, right? I think, um, you know, there would have to be that synergy between the public and, and private. And that's back to what, um, that he said, whereby the government, right, really see the tech space as just, and even the founders coming out and, uh, you know, as just a place to make money, right? It's not really uh, like an opportunity. If they see, see the opportunity, I'm a, 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 like a believer of um, tech and universities, the way you have it that in, in, the, in the Bay Area, where you have Stanford, and you see a lot of engineers coming out from, 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 from there, basically, right? So I think um, it would have to first start on, on a top level first, right, with the universities basically coming into this and joining forces with the entrepreneurs and the companies, right, before it trickles down to secondary schools and also going down to elementary, basically, right, but it would have to start somewhere. And I think, you know, partnering with the universities and first of all, even, um, you know, making the talent that comes out of the universities much more um, um, what got globalized and, and, they, and they basically have the right talents, right, and then we can now go down to secondary for the secondary because the infrastructure at secondary level and um, the infrastructure needed right and the structure needed for secondary programs right and even elementary programs can really be be daunting for you know an entrepreneur like, like me right basically it would take someone like a microsoft right or or like a google to, to really do such uh, programs at scale you know basically except if, if the government comes in i think he will have a better answer than that <laughs> oh the answer was was really succinct um and again, insightful, very informative. So even though you mentioned not having um, a, a, like a, a pipeline program, so to speak, for elementary and high school school students, the idea that you're thinking about it, right? Forward thinking about what place or what, um, yeah, what position the the government can have in encouraging elementary schools and high schools, and then you know your part as a fine tech um, industrialist what your place is in that pipeline. I think those are um, really good things to start discussing and, and, and rather, you know, talking about. So E, um, I'm just gonna repeat the question so that, you know, we can hear from both you and Bolade's angles about um, starting working, you know, what that would look like to start working with elementary and high school students. So what programs do you have set up for, you know, or, or plan to set up for elementary or high school students so that talents can start uh, being groomed in Nigeria. Oh, I think you're on mute. Forgive me. Um, okay. We're active investors in that space. Um, so starting with, um, you know, we've invested in a company called STEM Cafe, which basically helps kids um, experience science um, in a relaxed play field setting. Um, and for many young kids, you know, it's the first time they actually get an opportunity to experience um, science in a way that they can understand it because there's very little equipment or resources for practical learning within universities, right? So um, it's not just within universities, but within the secondary schools without this sort of intervention. Um, then we've, we've invested in, in quite a number of um, computer labs. Uh, we do quite a bit of computer labs for kids, um, very similar to the story that um, Boladi was telling. I also was in Muslim girls secondary school in, um, in Odoekon, and we had to do a similar thing because we realized how bad things were. Um, um, we, we've also, I'll say that there's also been some faith-led initiatives, is the best way to put it, around coding, um, working very closely with faith-based organizations to help their, you know, young people under their care to be able to learn how to build software. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a lot of initiatives out there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that not a lot of people are doing, particularly within Yapa. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Okay. I'm excited to hear more. I definitely am, especially, um, what you were saying about the work that's being done to encourage women in tech, you know, no matter the age, 
we understand that women are typically seen as vulnerable, um, part of vulnerable communities. So that's really exciting to hear. So what I would love to do is actually open up the floor to, uh, to hear from audience members themselves. So for those of you that have been posting, you know, you're, I can see the excitement, the passion, wink, wink, um, the passion, you know, the eagerness to um, really converse with our panelists. So I would love to open up the floor. For those of you that have been posting questions, this is now your opportunity. Um, if you could just raise your hand, there's a raise hand button in Zoom that will just let us know, hey, I would like to unmute and, and ask them a question. So I'm gonna give you all some time to do that. If you have any questions and would like to unmute yourselves, this is your opportunity. I know some would rather me ask it, ask the question on their behalf, which yeah, is okay, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have somebody, um, the first person that raised up their hands is Obafemi. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Obafemi, you can ask your question by all means. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Iyabuiji a question. Um, so you um have spoken a bit about the talent city and what it's all about, and I went further to um look at the website um for the the project and i've been looking through and so far it's caught my interest and i'm really like curious about as to whether it's going to be like an incubation type um scenario where um investors are um available and then people with ideas are encouraged to come forward and they are nurtured like with specific um, goals in mind like um, being able to manage their own companies effectively and such and such as well as um, they are provided with a platform to have like easy access to those investors and pitch their ideas as well as like get funding and the likes that's my primary question um, if they're still to ask all the rest. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have some some of the blueprints. I don't know where you got it from, but um, <laughs> I would say, you know, um, part of what we're working towards is really an environment where startups can come and build without distractions for a couple of months. Um, and all they just have to do is focus on optimizing their businesses and they can do so while being around other very, very smart people, um, which obviously improves outcomes over time. Um, and the expectation would be that, you know, in exchange for that, we'll take a, um, a sum of equity and build out with them. Um, and, you know, especially if they're building solutions to problems where they need government you know, approvals and stuff like that, and we would have the, the ability to to create and formulate and enforce those rules within our um, our zone, you know the the area that we bought, which is called the zone, within our That's, our special economic zone. That's um, awesome. So, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of work to go into the design, and we're still very early. We just have bare land. So, but I'm sure as things evolve, oh, um, we'll be to just. If you sign up, we'll keep you updated about how things are going. Sure thing. Obviously, Rome wasn't built in a day, but I, I am looking forward to how everything will turn out. Um, <laughs> I see other people's hands up, and I don't want to hold the, the line, so I'll just wait and see if it's like okay. time and it will come back to me. I still have further questions. Thank you very much. Sure. sure. Um, I, I did want to also uh, mention to, um, to a kind host that I, I would need to drop off soon. Because um, I have a very early church service to to run tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pastor, we hear you. One of many, one of the many job titles. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Edward. You can mm -hmm. um 
unmute yourself and ask the question. Hey, thank you. Um, Edward DC here. Uh, you know, I've been listening and this is a really, really great um, session that we have in here. And it's, you know, I've learned a lot. Um, I myself have been in the uh, in the tech field for over over 16 years. Um, one of the questions that I've always had, I've always heard from, from people, especially for the folks that are coming in, they've asked me, okay, what is the best sector to go into? And I tell in, in tech. And and I and I know I'm, for right now I'm more of a software. So I've heard people say, okay, go into software, go into data analytics, go into infrastructure, go into financial tech. Um, and for those who are here in you know in the diaspora, again, those who are trying to get into tech um, at this stage, and what would you guys recommend for folks who are going in, and also just for um, future investment as far as in the career and also trying to make money and also just trying to be successful in the tech industry. Yeah, um, I think a lot of this stuff is very dependent on the kind of skills you come with from the industry that you're coming from. And I find that whenever you try to do it without that acknowledgement that you spend 15, 16 years of your life doing one thing and you can't just assume that thing doesn't exist because you want to get into tech. Um, <laughs> you actually end up uh, on the on the tough side, um, and you don't la tend to last because you know it's a little bit more difficult than that. So my 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 advice um, to people is typically look if you're maybe an accountant, right? Um, you know, maybe brush up your skills so you can be a great financial planning and analysis coordinator, and and that's you know. That's more techy, you know, but that gives you a, a better foothold within the organization in terms of how you enter the tech. Um, if you know you don't have to go in as an engineer or product manager, I think the question you have to ask yourself is what natural skills do I have and what am I able to accomplish? And then you kind of put yourself in a position where that's possible. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's basically how I would answer that. Hello, can you hear me? I hope yes, that answered thank, your question. Yes, that did, that did. Sorry, I was trying to get off mute. Thank you so much and I appreciate it. Yeah, I think I would I'll, yeah, I might also add that, um, like he said, right? Um, it's also leveraged on the, 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 the skills that you basically have, right? Because truly we, we think too much on tech about the tech side, right? But for me personally, um, in the last, say, six months, I've been in dire need for, an, for accountants, for uh, legals, for uh, patients, HR, you know, so, so those kind of things are very, very important, especially for, for, for venture-backed companies, right, that are trying to scale, right? So I think if you have skills there, right, um, companies are really urgently looking for such skills in the African uh, uh, scene, you know, especially in Nigeria, right? And even skills that could help companies scale cross countries, right? You'll be so shocked that even uh, skills like a French speaking person is needed, right? That's very funny, right? In my own kind of business, right? We are, we are basically trying to penetrate the francophone region and um, having French speaking talent is very quite difficult, but that, that could really interface with us, you know? So such skills begin to, that's some, some rules that you don't think are important start getting very, very key you know, when you're trying to scale, for example, across the continent, you know, so, 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 so I think it really depends on what do you have and how can you brush up on that, you know, and feed it into the, the tech space, right? And, and you basically see how important those very soft skills are. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for that question. Okay, we have two more questions and then we are going to enter into just like, you know, closing. So Abby, please unmute and then ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both for your time this afternoon. Um, so I love that your companies are solving many issues that we have in Nigeria. And I've thought twice about my question, but I'm still gonna ask it. Um, government can solve many of the issues in Nigeria. So I'm sure you've thought, both thought about this and we're going into an election year. What do you think as startup founders and as people in that in the tech space, that your role is with government and politics. Yeah, let me advocate um, for E. <laughs> e, I want to advocate for you. E is doing something <laughs> awesome in this space. So 
please let's let all would lead to him because um, we are all trying to back his, his initiative in the industry. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, you're, you're too kind. Um, well, my, my own mindset when it comes to politics and governance is obviously, you know, like I mentioned, you know, it's one of the big challenges. So there's no question of sitting on the sidelines because the industry has become too important um, to leave to politicians. Um, and so what, but, but I think there is a civic responsibility um, and then there is a personal responsibility and they're two different things. Um, on the civic responsibility side, um, the reality is, you know, companies, all companies can do is just encourage, you know, their entire circle of influence to pick up their PVCs and go vote. Um, you know, that's, that's about as much as they can do. <laughs> Anything else would, we don't have, um, we haven't yet taken the issue to the Supreme Court. So we don't yet know whether companies are people, we don't have, uh, you know, any, any amazing uh, campaign finance cases that provide a, a template for large corporates to dominate elections like in the US. So I would say we don't really know the case law there, but that's what companies can do. But I think there's a lot more that can be done on the personal side. Um, oh, I'm sorry, with the companies as well, they, they have to pay for messaging that educates the populace as well as um, those who are vying for office about what our priorities are as an industry. So one of the things that I've done, for example, is we've got a bunch of publications that we've sent out to every single person who was declared to want to be president. And it's basically just a, here's a tech policy for the next five years. Please don't derail it. Um, <laughs> if you need some free content for your manifesto, here's some stuff you can do. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of stuff we've done for aspirants and pushed with aspirants just to get them to be able to see what the real problems are. But I think that the personal side is where there's a lot more responsibility, right? Um, and it ranges from some people opting to run themselves to some people um, deciding to back people at the primary stages because people always wait until the actual election, but then if they give you two dots on the ticket, like what does it matter if you go and vote, right? Um, so, so sometimes, you know, it's important for you to get involved at the primaries to make sure that you have a candidate that's friendly to the industry and at the very least to our own interest, actually take the realms to make it happen. And then beyond that, I also think that there is a, there's an element of engagement that we often miss out on. Um, one of, one of the things I try to do is I try to be on hand for any appointments into government. Uh, boards or, or advisory boards or stuff like that. I try to clear my schedule to make time for those because that's that's an element of public service. We don't serve juries here in Nigeria. So that's about as much public service as you can get. And then, you know, we try our best to make sure that it doesn't influence us or we don't, we're not in a position where we must um, share that with uh, with others. Um, and that's very important because there's a lot of poisoned uh, chalice is when you work with government. So for example, in our company, we don't um, take any um, payments uh, from, from government for work done. Um, but um, so we, we don't have an incentive to go and look for anybody's contracts or whatever <laughs> in exchange for, for helping them out. So, so you know, there's, there's just a bunch of these things that we have to have the ability to do in a personal capacity. And we have to have the ability to do as together. Um, that's that's my point of view. Thank you. Um, we're closing up this last question very quickly. Festus, can you please unmute um, yourself and ask? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for um, number one for the work that you've done just to get to this point, because oftentimes just getting started. Is, uh, is hard enough. So I thank you both for, for that work. Um, just, uh, and I've already put my email in the chat, just wanting to collaborate with uh, student development and young adult development. And so uh, we could do some mentoring for soft skills. And so um, I've already put that information in the chat. So it's more of a comment. That's awesome. Question. Thank you so much. Okay. 
that's so cool. And I, I trust that a lot is going to come out of that connection. Thank you so much, Francis, for that um, actually closing remark. So with that being said, we just thank you um, to gentlemen E and Bola Day for coming out and speaking to us this afternoon. If you have any closing remarks, um, E, can you start us off and then Bola Day finish us strong? Uh, and also, please let the audience know how they can reach out to you. Um, yes. Sure. I mean, you know, for me, I would say I consider our diaspora a big part of the evolution that's necessary for building the future in, in, in Nigeria in particular. Um, and, and I'm always happy to support diasporans who are looking to make a difference here. Um, and, you know, one of the many ways that we've had the privilege of doing that um, is by, you know, the many founders who, I remember one or two founders who are now famous founders where we just bought a ticket and put them on the plane to Nigeria. I told them to stay one month and see how they liked it. So if, if there's very talented people who want to do that kind of stuff, please definitely reach out to me. Um, um, and, um, and I'll be happy to, to be helpful, as helpful as I can. Um, and I would also say, um, this is something else to keep in mind. I, I also feel um, that it's, 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 it's um, you know, it's also important that we organize. And so this, this is why forums like this are extremely important, right? Because we have to organize to be able to, in a very organized way, um, given that we are organized, um, intervene in, in critical projects. Um, you know, one of the things I like to say is, you know, we've been sending remittances to Africa, 25 billion to 40 billion, depending on whose numbers you believe to Africa for the last, you know, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And um, yeah, and, 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 and uh, you know, um, the, one, of, one of the joys um, um, of, of, of that, of that, uh, um, of, of that process is that, um, is that you, you, you actually get to build um, interesting relationships and networks that can be that can be helpful for the companies, right? Um, and and so I think it's really important that groups like this find a way to collaborate with other groups like yours um, to actually build incredible networks that can support innovation on the continent. So whether that's by investing, whether that's by mentoring talent, um, or whether that's by um, contributing. Um, um, to government or, or, or by, um, um, you know, uh, uh, providing, being a much needed voice in the right rooms for Africa and, and African startups. I think all of that is, 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 is part of the beauty of, of what is possible um, um, with a collaboration like this. So uh, looking forward to seeing more from you guys. Thank you. Um, please, and if you can, in the comment section, just um, let um, everyone know how they can just keep in contact well, yeah, with just you. Send me an email. you. That's the easiest way. Send me an email. I put my email in, in the group chat. So just send me an email. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so everyone, email in the group chat. Thank you so, so much for um, coming out today. Bolade, please round us off. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you, Eve, for, for the opportunity for coming here also, and then um, for everyone. Um, so for me, I'll basically say that um, some of my best investors so far have been um, a lot of um, African diasporans, right? So um, they've really been very helpful um, in helping me scale, right? Basically in helping me figure out a lot of things in terms of, um, you know, technology, in, in terms of um, business strategy and things like that, because a couple of them have worked for the likes of Microsoft, um, Google, and a bunch of that, right? So we're exchanging that experience with my team has really been helpful, basically. So I think that um, there are more founders like, like, like me out there, right, that would need some of those experiences, right? So, um, uh, so, I, so, I, so I really think that the that, 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 that aspirants are very key in helping the, the local talent and, and, the, and the local companies to really come into a global stage, right? So if you're one of them here, it would be really nice to connect, right? So the reason I say so is at, um, at my firm, ID, right, what we really uh, focus on purely, it's not really the funds, right? It's more or less the mentoring for the founders themselves. So we have like a community session every month. 
I will bring different, um, um, you know, um, uh, what, could, what the professionals to help these founders figure out a lot of issues that they are having in their businesses, right? Uh, because I, I believe that the funds will come after. He has so much money to spend, so the money will come after basically, right? But you know, the skills that we really need is very essential, right? And that's why we focus more on them on helping these founders get these soft skills, right? That they can help to scale up, grow their business, right? So I think that's brothers are very, very um, pivotal to that growth. And, um, and also in terms of the investments too, we also need more of those investments in the African community, right? Um, it's really, really essential, basically. If you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm very heavy on LinkedIn, actually. Uh, so you could reach out to me on LinkedIn and um, I also dropped my email. You could also shoot an email, basically, yeah. Thank you so, so much, E and Bola Day for coming out and being our amazing, amazing, amazing guests. If everyone can just please give them a round of applause, emojis, emojis. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to our VP of Business and Professional Development, um, Ngechi. Please take over. Thank you. Can't hear you. Yeah. I'm so sorry. My I had I was on mute. I was saying thank you so much, E and Bola Day, especially E for joining us when it's really bedtime over there. It's about what 11 p.m. West African time. But I can see the kiddies are not yet. <laughs> they're not yet uh, in bed. But uh, we are very grateful for this opportunity. So much that we have learned. Um, Namsi as an organization. This is what we do. Um, we really are very, very passionate about the Nigerian American experience and elevating um, ourselves, both here as diasporans and connecting ourselves to the continent and just making sure that we are representing Nigeria the best way that we can. Um, our president is currently here, I believe. I don't know if she wants to drop a few comments. Mrs. K, are you still on? I don't see yes, it. I am. Um, oh. in, 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 unfortunately, I somehow my video I cannot get it to work. I would have loved you all to see my old face. Um, thank you all. I mean, I can't thank you enough. I'm also in happen to be in Lagos at this time. I know how late it is. I mean, and um. Just to say that this is what NAMSI is all about. And for those of you who are not aware of NAMSI, um, please go, um, go on our website. You're going to get a lot of information about what we do and who we are. And we are all just very passionate about building and empowering Nigerians, both in everywhere, um, particularly in the US. So we will be reaching out to you certainly, um, E and Baladi, I'm sure you're going to hear more from us. I'm hoping maybe I can connect with you while I'm still here in Lagos for another few weeks. I'd love to meet with you and um, also to just even introduce myself and get to know you more. Um, and good ideas you've, you've thrown out on things, how we can be a part of um, building this um, um, system and making sure that um, all Nigerians benefit from it. Thank you very much. It's late here. And I know that um, people are already ready to sign up. So look forward to seeing you again. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. Um, take a moment to grab all the resources in the chat before we um, close out the session. And please stay connected to NAMSI. All our social media is at NAMSI Houston. Our website is www.namsihouston.org. Reach out to Ii and Bolade. Ii, thank you so much. And we are watching and we're seeing all the amazing things you're doing for Africans and for Nigerians. Thank you all. Have a good day and good night to those in Nigeria. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.